Chinadu Inekwe is a GP general partner at O21 Capital. O21 Capital is an early stage venture capital firm investing in the future of commerce, creating market access to the next generation of internet users. As part of his role as GP, he also co-produces the Venture World podcast, Social Media Week, Lagos, and a Future of Money conference. He's a Moonshot Fellow and Kravis Lab for Social Impact and a founding member of the Ford's Forbes Impact Community. Prior to O21 Capital, he was a principal on the pre-seed and C-team of Exponential Creativity Ventures and managed Affinity VC, an investment syndicate of consulting firms deploying over 15 million since 2015. Um, Chinadu, if you can go into a little bit more about your, your, your background, you have you have a few things that uh, that I know that that are not on your on your bio, and um, and then if you can go into your into your presentation and we'll do some Q&A with you. Thank you. All right, all right, thank you for that. So um, uh, my background is uh, sort of varied, but all in finance and in law. I started out um, working at Wild Gotcha and Mangy's as a private equity fund formation attorney. And um, I transitioned to working at Merrill Lynch um, in the leverage finance group. And um, I, that, that experience on the public market side kind of informed my experience as to what I wanted to do on the private side. But I've always kind of come and approached the private market with the lens of my understanding from the public market and working with private equity firms and understanding how the process goes from public to private and private to public and kind of how that cycle continues to um, kind of happen. Uh, so after my experience from the public market, I took it and I caught this uh, entrepreneurial bug while I was working for a small investment bank and headed their Africa uh, practice or managed their Africa uh, practice. And um, that led me to starting my own startup, starting investing in ex uh, startups through Tip Hub and Accelerator. Then um, I was at that time, I was working for Obama as a Power Africa analyst at OPIC. Then I transitioned to the World Bank because you can't invest while you're in the government. Um, at least they, you couldn't at that time. <laughs> um, and then, uh, you know, uh, from my experience at the World Bank and the Tip Hub, I decided to, you know, get strong, more invested in the um, in the U.S. And that's where I started an investor syndicate, investor network called Affinity. And um, at the same time, I joined a firm called Exponential Creativity Ventures. So that that came, that's like my experience and my profile before I launched O21, which is a $50 million seed fund that we're still raising our first close is on uh, August 16th. Um, you know, and that also brought me to my experience as a VC in residence at Techstar, as a venture partner at Republic, um, you know, my degrees from various schools. So, you know, over this time period for about since 2012, I've started, uh, I've invested in 60 companies, had five exits, deployed $32 million in capital, which is not a lot of capital in the private market, but based on my experience from pre-IPO investing to in my investor network to early stage investing, pre-product at Tip Hub to product investing at Exponential Creativity Ventures. I've seen sort of a lot of the space, including my private equity and public market experience. So uh, when uh, I was fortunate enough to speak with Mark and he was uh, talking to me about the Fang Group, I said, well, I've been knowing on this concept around SPACs that I wanted to have an intelligent discussion around. And uh, he said, well, you could have it in this group. So I'm, I'm glad to just um, sort of kick off this uh, discussion with uh, my colleagues, Eric and uh, Robert. They are very much more steeped in this uh, market, the SPAC market. From my lens, I'm in the private market and I am basically able to see how SPACs affect the tail end of the acquirer universe and how that filters down into the private market opportunities. But just to put it in context, 
you know, SPACs are not new, but this time is different, right? There's a couple of factors that is making this time a little bit unique. Um, you know, the beyond the SPAC deal count, the, the, the factors that have created the opportunity for these SPACs is because of the appetite of everyday investors to be in public market companies that has has increased you can uh, you can say because there's been a decline in public listings for over 20 uh, close to 25 years since 1996 and that decline from 7000 uh 7600 listed companies to about 3000 listed companies has created this appetite amongst everyday investors where they traditionally previously they were able to participate in facebook or I mean, not Facebook and AOL and Microsoft when their valuations were 500 million. The private market in these days have now allowed for uh, companies like Facebook, for an example, when they went public, or um, the opportunities of the growth have been limited to the private market. So that increase in late stage private market that allowed startups to grow larger and have higher valuations has increased the acquirer of this, the target universe for SPACs, right? So that it's justified the continued raise of, of funds. So these are things that, these are dynamics that are really private market dynamics that have allowed for SPACs to continue to thrive, right? And then the uh, the other part is just the risk spectrum, you know, the, uh, the US treasuries uh, being, near zero has affected the risk spectrum, the risk appetite of the market as well for institutional investors. Now this has created this IPO window that is really both taken advantage of by private startups and also uh, for these uh, SPACs, right? So, but one of the things I wanted to sort of clearly indicate is that the private market isn't as, uh, transparent in terms of price visibility as the public market. So private market valuations um, have not really uh, moved in the same in as quickly as the SPACs have have grown. So if you see it, you see this chart that I've listed. Most fund managers, about seventy percent of us, have don't believe that SPACs by themselves are actually a problem or have caused any uh, disturbances in the private market. And I can tell you that that's because it's really been a, um, it's really been very positive for everyone that SPAC, the SPACs have actually come to the market. And they really only affect the, the later stages of the valuations because they've, in, they've increased or encroached rather on um uh on the late stage guys uh the private uh the private equities jobs and the larger funds that have now um started to be actually competitors for my earlier stage capital it has actually affected their valuations the pre-ipo valuations if you will still in the private market but the pre-ipo valuations more than this uh affected the um the early stage valuations and ultimately what we've seen in the market is more vcs taking advantage of this ipo window themselves to create their own especially the larger firms creating their own spac vehicles that complement their own funds and their own uh, franchises so for the private market for vcs like myself we don't really see that uh, we don't think of SPACs as the boogeyman. They don't affect us as much on the early stage valuations when we're doing our transactions. They really more so affect, um, and their effect on tech m &A in general, um, the va later stage valuations that may affect some of the CFOs that are on this call. Um, I, I, I would love to hear from you to see what your effect is, but from the data, what it looks like is that it hasn't quite affected anything because just the tech M&A landscape is hot, generally, overall, right? And you see the increase from 2019, the increase of technology, M&A has increased substantially. Now, 
there's a couple of reasons for that, but we don't have to get into it. But the idea that there's an extended IPO window and direct listings have created what my firm sees as a three-tiered landscape for potential exit opportunities for where if you are a strong company with over a hundred million dollars in revenue, um, you're probably likely to choose a direct uh, direct listing or a, um, a an IPO just generally because um, you probably have, if you have that type of revenue, it speaks to your ability in, on your own team to have likely likely recruited a CFO, you likely have a treasury management function, you likely have the ability to forecast and do the functions that uh, target or sponsors, SPAC sponsors sort of offer. And um, then there's, so with those innovations, it's created the system of where some people are going for these, uh, the IPOs. So people are being counseled, the founders are being counseled to go to an IPO if they have strong revenue metrics. And then they are also counseled if they are, um, and this is just for the IPO, if they wanna become a public company. And then they're also counseled to go di direct listings. And then there's the option of them to go to SPACs. And then there's just general M&A. So there's those three options that we're seeing for the startups. and what's essentially happening is unless it's a very, very strategic combination, uh, the M&A is taking less priority because the valuations that you'll get on the public market and the valuations that you get um, on uh, from, from SPACs are very attractive. So it, it's kind of this triangle of trying to figure out where a company lands, what type of, uh, what the, where their revenue is, and what their team is. But that's where things are. And largely because of the way SPACs have been, it has um, what we believe in our firm is that we haven't seen the actual effects of SPACs on the market because of how technology and the private market or VC market valuations kind of filter in over nine months uh, we we basically gauge about nine months is the time frame for when a effect on the later stage or the IPO window really affects the valuations of the of trickles into the um, the technology early stage market, right? So what we're seeing, if you look at last year, the tech and M and A volume from SPACs was only 41 announced deals, whether those are the only deals that actually had, but only 41 announced deals. This year, we're expecting the trajectory is about 300 announced deals from the backlog of all the um, tech M&A or the SPACs that went public last year, assuming there's not extensions. So what we what if that looks like what it could look like, the average SPAC deal this year has eked up from 1.3 to about $2 billion in value in terms of enterprise value, uh, that would generate about $600 billion in just SPAC-led um, SPAC M&A in the market, which is essentially all of the tech M&A market. And if that value, if the valuations stay the same and this year they've creeped up, our view is that that will affect our market in 2022. Uh, but in this market, in the 2021 market, we think that it's going to really have a, a very serious impact on the technology M&A acquirer universe uh, because of so much capital chasing so many deals and then layering in the bifurcation of the market where the best companies or the strongest revenue companies, not the best companies, companies with the largest amount of revenue at this point will likely go to the IPO window because it's open. These SPACs are really gonna affect the um, this mid-tier uh, market of startups that are sub $100 million in revenue, which is very much an acquirer universe for traditional tech M&A. So what we see, what we're believing is in our portfolio for the opportunities that we have, uh, my partner, 
Uh, Mark Fleming used to be at uh, Alibaba and invested off their balance sheet in late stage companies primarily. So we've been tracking this as part of our, uh, to inform our investment analysis. And so what we see and what we believe that's going on is that um, VCs like myself, and then also we want to build stronger relationships to with uh, financial professionals at large corporations so that we can help navigate um, this innovation economy that over the next two years we'll find there to be a lot of shakeups where if uh, acquirer pays too much, which we forecast many will, that there probably won't be a, uh, the company won't survive. And we take options to take, you know, take shares of um, a company that we've sold the new company that uh, it's, it uh, converts into, if it's a publicly listed company, or we just take the capital. We prefer to take longer positions with our own partner capital. So our kind of decision-making from our legacy fund is to, when we do face acquisitions, is to work extensively with CFOs so that we can find the right uh, valuation that um, is for the long-term. So that's, that's basically my, our synopsis of what's going on in the private market and how SPACs are affecting it. So I wanted to give ample room and time for you know uh, questions and a dialogue because that's that was my goal in this whole uh, in this whole process. Excellent. Um, thank you, uh, Chinadu, for for sharing that overview, um, folks. If you do have some questions now, um, feel free to you know chime in, uh, unmute your mic, and uh, un you know unmute your camera, and if it. Of course, if you're, you know, some of us can be shy and you want to speak later on or you're waiting for the first person to ask a question, we can go ahead and move on to our next speaker and we'll have ample time at the end of our discussion to ask questions. And of course, everybody's jumping at the bit to ask questions. All right, super. Um, what is the likelihood of additional SEC regulation? Um, you know, I don't want to speak for the SEC, but I would, from what I know, I'm in DC. Um, that's where we have one of our offices. It is likely, highly likely, I would say that there's additional regulations on sponsors, um, likely focus on the guidance of the issue when the deals are announced. But um, I'll let uh, Robert and Eric answer that question as they are kind of probably squarely in the face of dealing with that. Robert, uh, Eric, do you have any any points to chime in on that? Well, sure. Um, uh, I'd I would just note that um, there's a new administration and there's a there's a different tone, um, you know, partially as a result of the new administration. In September 2020, Jay Clayton at the SEC told us SPACs are good and they provide competition to the IPO process. Um, in December and then March and then May, a, a, as we transitioned presidential administrations, the SEC issued a series of investor alerts. Um, they expressed concern about conflicts of interest. They encouraged a higher level of disclosure than you get with a regular IPO. They became concerned with the lack of financial projections. Remember that, that you know, historically IPOs have involved financial projection, but mergers did not require them. Um, and, um, you know, that's part of the appeal of SPACs is, is the idea of going public uh, with fewer, uh, fewer projections, but, but the SEC has expressed concern about that. And then I think a, a real uh, warning across the bow was on April 12th, the SEC issued a bulletin about warrant accounting um, that challenged whether warrants are really a liability as opposed to equity. And you have hundreds of SPACs scrambling to figure out uh, how to account uh, for the warrants associated with SPAC transactions and whether they can be counted as equity as they historically were, or whether in many cases, uh, they're more appropriately accounted for as liability. Um, this has kind of been a full employment act for audit firms. Um, 
uh, but it's it, it's definitely um, you know created a little bit of uh, of a slowdown in in the SPAC momentum that we've been seeing. Excellent, Robert. Do you have anything to add? Yeah, so I would just say I, I do think that there will be you know continued regulatory pressure on the SPAC market in one way or another. Um, I, I don't think that the warrant issue was a major issue. And while there was a lot of scrambling that may have gone on uh, for people, um, you know, it was just maybe a warning shot across the bow um, to let people know that the SEC is thinking they're on top of this. Um, I, I am confident that they'll, they will come down with other uh, regulatory issues that need to be addressed, but I think that the you know the SPAC train has has well left the station at this point. Um, those of us who fought the war, and I think Eric was involved as well, you know, years ago, when the SEC would drag its feet on getting mergers done, um, you know, this is nothing compared to those times. So I think everyone has to get ready for the new normal. Um, but I think that this, you know, as I'll talk about, I mean, I think it's ju it just becomes another viable alternative for going public. Fantastic. And um, this question is from Edward Kane. And if you do want to uh, speak up, feel free to unmute yourself. Um, otherwise, I will master a ceremony for you. How are legal fees okay. structured for SPACs? And do any firms defer legal fees until the DSPAC? Any of you can feel free to uh, take the question, Robert, Eric, Chinidu. Eric, I would say you're you're the one with the experience on this. Yeah, well, uh, still, that, that's a level of detail I'm still learning. I will say that, you know, the the initial sponsor equity investment, you know, so I, you know, I'm part of a SPAC that went public in March, and um, and it raised you know, it sort of raised, you know, a couple of hundred thousand dollars to get going and then a couple of million dollars to, to, to file for, for the IPO. And then it got serious about raising the, the money that goes into the, into the blank check company. And I know that those first two preliminary rounds of a few hundred thousand dollars and a couple million dollars included legal fees um, and included the legal fees to actually do the IPO that starts the process. Um, in terms of on, you know, the legal fees that are really part of the DSPAC transaction and the M&A structure, I'm not actually sure uh, how those are treated. Uh, I, it's just a level of detail I, I haven't learned yet. So I'll, I'll, have, to, I'll have to punt on, on that element of the question. Yeah, Mark, no, no worries. Mark, Go ahead. I, would just, I would just add, I mean, and, you know, like Eric, I'm not sure I know the, uh, the perfect answer to this, but I think no different than, you know, traditional broken deal, you know, kind of fees that kind of go away, um, you know, where a law firm may write off some of their fees. I think that it's probably no different here, um, you know, where they're taking some of it up front and some of it on the back end and depending on, you know, how they bill you. Um, it's either going to be very straightforward or, you know, it, it, it's going to be complex, but I think they, they've got to sort of work with what, uh, what they have. Yeah, I think just, just my, there's, um, I think there, it becomes, it's different for different people, like, you know, like different firms handle it differently, but it's because if they if they know that you're running like some SPACs are franchises that they just keep on launching different vehicles the way that they bill them from what i know is different than the way that they bill other sort of single single SPACs right like uh one-off SPACs so um it's really going to be based on your pre-existing relationship with the firm but um it's it's not uh it's more than likely going to be billed you're going to get billed up front Mark, I noticed that uh, a lawyer from Mintz, I apologize, I didn't see his name, responded to the question. So assuming that none of us are lawyers, maybe we should uh, <laughs> let him pipe in on that. Hey, 
Hey there, this is um, Matt Simpson here. I'm a corporate partner at Mints, and I, I represent mostly on the DSPAC side, but we certainly have colleagues that are on the SPAC side. Um, my, my claim to fame is I'm a former colleague of Chinedu's at, at Weill, so um, it's great to see him and, and spend some time with him again. Um, yeah, I, I agree with everything that's been said here in terms of the, the SPAC formation, sponsorship, IPO process. You know, those fees are, are part of the fundraising effort there. On the DSPAC side, those transactions can take extended periods of time to evolve. You know, some sponsors go through, some SPACs will target multiple targets at the same time, trying to figure out who the one, the right target is to take the business combination. And so it can, it can get complicated and it can get expensive. Most firms are, are billing in the ordinary course up to a point sort of thing. You know, as Chinadu said, you're paying for it um, as the transactions roll in monthly installments. And then at some point in the deal, when a deal is looking more likely, many firms will defer fees until the closing of the transaction. Uh, the accounting for that, how that impacts on your equity value if you're on the DSPAC side is certainly something to, um, to factor in um, and make sure that you're getting credit for any transaction fees if you're on the, on the, the DSPAC. But um, fees, fees are very expensive. They are very complicated transactions because you're doing a merger Often, if it's domestic, at least you're doing a business combination, which is a merger. You're raising a pipe process at the exact same time, and you're doing public filings. So it's um, it's a lot of work for law firms, to say the least. Excellent, thank you. And and you know this is the kind of format that we would like to have um, a very informal conversation. So if we, I know I'm not going to say if we have experts in the audience. I know we have experts in the audience, and so if you do know know something that one of the speakers doesn't please feel free to chime in so that we can all uh, learn from one another. That's the purpose, one of the purposes of this meeting. All right, so uh, from Jim uh, Zudima, do SPAC sponsors ever commit capital before launching the pipe? I'm trying to understand uh, what does before mean because you would have to, it's either Jim, do you want to uh, yeah. do you want to unmute yourself and and um, expound further on your question, please? Jim Zudima. Yeah, sorry, this is Jim. I guess what I'm saying is, <clears throat> and maybe I didn't word my question properly, but um, do you ever see deals in which the spec? commits the capital without a redemption. In other words, when the when the amount of cash to the target is known uh, in advance. Oh, okay. So no, what I've been seeing, uh, the market that I've been tracking is that the amount of SPACs that have pipes, it it's less than 40% of SPACs are coming and making their offer with pipes attached. Right. So those are the numbers that I've seen. It may be increasing given the fact that the deal sizes are increasing. So maybe founders or targets are seeking more capital up front. But Eric, Robert, you probably see talk about the, the deal dynamics that you're seeing right now, as opposed to my sort of aftermarket tracking. Well, with, you know, with the spec that I'm associated with. Um, and, you know, I'm, you know, I'm somewhat new to this. I, I'm the guy who was brought in for M&A experience to help guys that had more SPAC experience. So I'm still climbing a learning curve, uh, you know, in terms of some of the specifics about SPACs. But what I can tell you is that, you know, the SPAC evaluates potential partners and, um, you know, goes from you know, uh, 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 non-binding terms to a mutually exclusive terms, but before, before our SPAC would announce a partnership, it wouldn't announce the partnership until it had sufficient indication of pipe interest. So, you know, either we, we would look at a, a target that didn't need a lot of cash, or we would, or we would have, uh, lined up enough people who, who at least verbally uh, indicated sufficient interest in the pipe to match the level of cash wanted. And if, and if we didn't get a sufficient pipe interest, no one would ever know that we'd, that we'd uh, gotten that far with the target. We would just move on to the, to the next target. So for, for us, 
getting getting the pipe, you know, at least semi formally lined up, it, it would be a necessary condition before we would announce the transaction and, and tell everybody about it. And I, you know, I just think to Eric's point, um, a lot of sponsors as well as investors look at the pipe as a validation point for the um, for the deal itself. So that if you see um, either you know, strategics or significant financial investors participating in the pipe, um, I think it gives investors a, uh, a good feel that the deal makes sense. So I think that that's something that also, you know, plays into this. The other thing is that deal sizes account for the necessity of having that pipe or having that you know, kind of stamp of approval so that very often people will need the pipe in order to complete the transaction or, um, you know, fill in for potential um, groups, you know, that uh, are looking uh, for their money back. Excellent. Thank you. And Jim, do you want to do your follow-up question quickly? Sorry about that. Sure. Uh, yeah, my follow-up question <clears throat> has to do with, it, it, you know, the, the value, it's back valuations, I think, are, it, you know, exceed private placement right now, and they have for quite a while. But my observation is that um, that some of the, some of the at least announced SPACs uh, are not trading very high. They're trading right around $9, 10 $11. Do you see that any, any movement in, in such that private placement valuations may sort of cross over and begin to exceed SPAC valuations anytime soon? Or, or do you see the SPAC phenomenon just sort of carrying on for a while? I think the, uh, the in, in my view, the reason why SPAC valuations are higher have to do with the fact that they have more constraints than a normal private placement would in terms of time. So if the, that clock of the timer forcing you to get into transactions and the fact that those transactions still have to be more marketable than your SPAC or your name is means that you have to bid up names that are marketable that have some brand presence that it's not just the thing so your my view as to what's causing the 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 delta in valuations are, are those constraints because you know anything once you add constraints it's going to create uh, different dynamics. So um, I think that it's going to, it's, I don't believe it's going to leak in because those dynamics are, unless those dynamics somehow emerge uh, for some of the the uh, private placement offerings, I don't think it's going to have too much of an effect. Yeah, I think it's, I, I would frame it similarly, which is that it's a little bit of apples and oranges and that it's not the tool that's creating the difference in valuations, but it's, it's the types of companies that have been going, that have been using the SPAC vehicle and the types of companies that have been doing uh, private placement. And, you know, arguably, um, you know, some companies have gone public via SPAC too early uh, or too many of them. Um, and the value is, has suffered. And maybe some of them, you know, should have, should have used a different tool. So I don't think that it's the tool creating the valuation. I just think it's, it's like a, what an academic might call a clientele effect or a, a, a different samples um, uh, between the two. Eric, this, this is Nelson. Just a quick follow-up question on that. Is it fair to say that there's an element of euphoria on the SPAC front, which is why you're seeing some of these valuations? And to Chinudu's point before, uh, you know, there is a, a, real impetus of these facts to do a deal of some sort because uh, they have a time limit. They, they have a 24 month window that they need to execute on. So is that maybe forcing some of them to actually beat up the price to, so to speak, attract the right company? Well, yeah, to, to oversimplify, and I'd, I'd be interested in, in Robert and Chinadu's view, view on this too, but to oversimplify, um, uh, you know, SPACs, SPACs were doing so well that both good and bad deals got bid up for a while. Yeah. Um, so whether you brought a good deal to market or you brought a bad deal to market, you made money. Um, yeah. And some of those deals were great, very solid fundamentals. Some 
maybe shouldn't have gone public yet. Um, and, and I think that what's happening now, it, it, I don't think, you know, I don't know that it's bubble and then bust, but I do think that, that a little bit of slowing may be a good thing in that, you know, good deals will still do well. And, and maybe some other deals either won't happen or, or, or won't, um, won't, won't, won't do as well. Um, but, uh, is, you know, some companies use SPACs to go public that, that arguably uh, shouldn't have done so yet. I also think that the notion that two years is, and I'm not sure if this is what SPAC Insider, uh, I think it's Christy Marvin, is saying, but the, the notion that two years is not enough to find an acquisition, you know, Chenadu, you can talk to this from the VC perspective or somebody else from the private equity perspective, but Two years is a long time to find an acquisition. And Eric, maybe you you would have a point, you know, something to say about that. But I think that it's um, undoubtedly two years is, is long enough. The other thing that I would just point out is that the private placements or the pipes that are being done alongside the, uh, the mergers are being done by the likes of Fidelity, of T. Rowe Price, et cetera. If they don't like the price, then they wouldn't be investing in the company. Um, the other thing I would point out, and I, I don't know how many people saw this, but there was something interesting today. Um, I think it was today or yesterday, but essentially SoftBank broke off talks with a potential merger target because they were, um, and this was actually a portfolio company of theirs, but I think everyone is a portfolio company of theirs. Um, but the reason that the talks broke off was because they were, uh, lower in on valuation than the company believed that they could get in the private markets. So I would just point out that it's not always the case. The, the, the only, and the last thing I'll just say is these are the public markets and that's ultimately where at least theoretically you should be able to get the highest valuation. Um, and, and, you know, by virtue of the fact that there's a vote at the end of the day, you're also gonna see, I mean, I think you'll see more of this, but you'll see deals either getting turned down or where there are massive redemptions. Right. Um, people can vote literally with their feet here. Yeah, I, I think the the other thing to, to say here that two years is a long time to find a deal. However, sort of what Eric mentioned is that the, the target companies, largely the technology companies, um, the ones that are the good targets, they're doubling or growing 30, 40%, and they're, they're used to the private market valuation. So when they forecast how long it will take for the deal to actually finalize, and the, val the fact that they, the scenario planning of wanting to have optionality at the end of that, similar to an M&A deal that may not go through, having the optionality of having runway, having capital, all of those things at play, you wanna make sure that you send a signal to the market that your valuation should be at a certain level if you have, if that deal breaks off, right? So you're, the, the, the targets are playing a different type of science than they would if it was, um, you know, just a, a regular M&A transaction because they're playing both the private market and the M&A acquirer landscape using the SPAC acquirers uh, to sort of set that tone for that scenario that they plan against. Super. And uh, we also have a SPAC insider, um, one of the it's one of the links that we shared in our emails uh, in the audience. So if, you've, if you do want to chime in, uh, please feel free to um, please feel free to join the conversation. We definitely want to make this a, uh, a conversation, superb. Okay, so I'll take one more question and then um, we'll go to, uh, to Eric's brief presentation. So from Sonal Patel, any limitation on registering amount of SPAC warrants on form S1? Very technical question there. Any takers? We'll throw, throw it out to Mintz, to Matt from Mintz. Sorry there we for go. asking. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Sonal. Go ahead. 
Yeah, no, I'm just saying, you know, it's, it's I, I know it's kind of a specific question, but it, re it really goes back to like st literally structuring the SPAC and at the point of registra registration, when you're registering the sh shares at the conclusion, can you, you know, I don't know if anybody knows the answer here from a regulatory perspective, what's allowed regarding warrants, basically? It's a great question. I don't know the answer, but, but I, you know, it's but it's, it's, it, the structure itself allows for the registration. So I don't. Right, that's true. Yeah. I don't, there's, and I think the investors would not invest unless they had that sort of. Matt vehicle. Simpson, do you want to chime in on that? Yeah, this is a Matt question. <laughs> is but is there a number? I mean, that that's that's really what I'm trying to get at. Like, is there is there maybe there isn't currently? Well, I, I think that the number is it just drives the economics. There's not a limit on how greedy a SPAC sponsor can get. Um, and so there's a range of, you know, how many warrants you get with each share. Right. And, and that's a reflection of what the SPAC sponsor can, can do, uh, can negotiate, yeah. I guess. But I don't, okay. I don't know that there's a natural limit on, uh, on that. I mean, my own SPAC markets itself as, as being very frugal and offering fewer warrants uh, per share, uh, you know, a fraction of a warrant per share, so that the economics make sense at a small size, and so part of part of our 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 stick or our marketing is that we can make the economics work at a, at the half unicorn size, where there are a lot of specs where the economics uh, the, the, the sponsors want so much that that it only really works if you're if you're beyond unicorn in, in terms of valuation. Excellent. But I don't know if that's getting at your 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 question, so now I'm just saying so that, that that's right. helpful. Yeah, I, I think that makes sense. Yeah, I, I I was I mean I came across some information very recently and that came up, but there was no answer to it. But so thank you. Super, and I'm I'm beginning to see that uh, we're going to have a part two to this conversation uh, where we have the uh, attorneys and the accountants. Um, on 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 this conversation and we've we've done part ones and part twos before and i can definitely see that um there's an appetite for it so um chino do thank you very much for your uh presentation um as he mentioned he is uh you know raising capital for his next fund as you know our other speakers are as well so if you're an lp and you want to privately connect with him please feel free to do so all right so i'd like to introduce our next speaker and you have heard him uh, uh, briefly in, in the Q&A. This is Eric Ball. Eric is a GP with Impact Venture Capital. Impact Venture Capital invests in early stage tech companies applying AI and data analytics to conventional sectors. 2017 through 19, Impact Fund made one, made investments in 17 portfolio companies and Impact Fund two invested in six new portfolio companies in 2020. Portfolio companies included Cornami, a high-performance computing company in Campbell, California, CatConnect, a capital markets startup linking corporate bond issuers to their institutional buyers. I'm very interested in hearing a little bit about that. And also uh, BondClick, providing market information for secondary trading in bonds based in New York. Also interested in hearing about that too. Impact Funds first brought together alumni of Oracle, DCM Ventures, Velocity VC and Impact launched its Fund 2 in 2020 with a continuing differentiation based on investments in early stage applications of AI, investment thesis centered around technologies which cut across multiple verticals and a commitment to partnering and co-investing with corporate venture arms. Um, I do know that uh, Chevron um, Technology Ventures is in the audience. I'm not sure if there are any other uh, corporate VCs um, that are here, but I'm um, interested in hearing your uh, presentation. And if you want to go into slide mode there, uh, Eric. Great. Um, uh, no, uh, uh, thanks. And uh, I, I, we've got we've had a chance to get into a, a level of detail uh, kind of beyond uh, so, some of what I plan to share. So I, I I'm, I'm recalibrating the level of uh, experience in this audience and we'll, we'll, we'll try to adjust uh, accordingly. No worries. Um, and then Eric, if you wanna hit slideshow, which is just a few, it's home insert design transition animation slideshow right there at the top. I'm sorry, what, what, um, what am Go I up to, home? Yeah. Uh, 
and then insert design transitions animations slideshow click on slideshow across up let's go up up slide back across this is amusing i'm sorry uh, I, I, no I, worries I mean... this is fine uh design yes then transitions animations slideshow yes click on slideshow from beginning Thank you. I, no worries. It's okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I, uh, I, I was doing it uh, more manually. Um, you already heard about my background. I don't need uh, to, to belabor my own background, but I just want to uh, highlight a couple of elements. Um, like many of you, I have spent, uh, you know, the bulk of my career in finance roles at large companies. I spent 28 years working in finance for large corporates. 11 of those years, I was the treasurer at Oracle, um, where I issued bonds, paid for acquisitions, and managed the corporate venture portfolio. I left, uh, uh, and Oracle was a very acquisitive company, which is uh, sort of how I landed up uh, in SPACs. My day job is not in SPACs, but, but they asked me to join a SPAC because of my M&A uh, experience. I left Oracle uh, five years ago and spent a year as CFO of an uh, AI uh, then startup, now Unicorn, called C3. Um, and for the last five years, my day job has been managing, uh, co-founding and managing an early stage technology venture capital firm, as Mark indicated. So that's my primary role. I invest in young startups that are applying AI I work with corporates to emphasize co-investment with corporates. And separate from this discussion with SPACs, if you have an interest in investing in early stage venture, or if you're a corporate venture arm looking for um, an independent VC to co-invest with, I would love to talk to you. We will close our fund too this year, and we're still accepting new investors. Uh, please, please reach out to me if you're interested. Um, but where I've gotten involved with SPACs is as a result of my own board work and M&A work. I was approached late last year by the Archimedes Tech SPAC uh, in a group called uh, SPAC Partners um, that had, they, they've done multiple SPACs in the past and they were looking for a board chair for the SPAC entity to focus specifically on technology here in Silicon Valley. And that's how I ended up as the board chair of the Archimedes Tech SPAC, which went public uh, three months ago in March and is a very uh, simple and standard, you know, empty shell with $133 million in cash. Um, and they brought in uh, the, the SPAC partners team, uh, myself and um, an advisor that, that I knew from my treasury days, uh, Brent Kalinikos who had been treasurer at Google and then C, uh, CFO at Uber. Um, so the point there is that SPACs are not my day job, um, but, uh, but they're a really interesting extracurricular activity and a chance to apply some of my background as a finance professional at a big company. And one of the points I'll, I'll touch on more later is the opportunity that SPACs represent for finance professionals. Um, uh, I think that uh, between the, the Chinadu's presentation and the uh, uh, Q&A, we, we've sort of covered some of the fundamentals of SPACs. Uh, the, the, the growth, uh, it doubled from 2019 to, to 2020, and it's on pace to, uh, to double again in 2021. Uh, the benefits of SPAC are that uh, they can be done faster uh, with more certainty, and they can recruit expertise um, into the company going public via SPAC. Uh, there are risks. Um, it can be expensive, uh, depending on the uh, sponsor economics for the particular sponsor that a company uh, partners with. And, um, and I would argue that the same speed that is a benefit can be a risk. Um, what I've observed with SPACs is that often um, when you tell a company that it can go faster, public faster via SPAC, um, the CEO gets excited and the CFO gets frightened. Um, and uh, I, I, you know, as somebody who looks at targets for a DSPAC transaction, I focus a lot on the finance function and whether the finance function is ready to go faster in going public and whether the CFO um, is prepared not just to go public, but to be public. And I think that that is 
in my view, an Achilles heel for, for many spec uh, uh, potential targets that, um, uh, th that, I, uh, that I look at. Um, there has been a little bit of a slowdown in the momentum. Um, uh, somebody asked about, uh, about SPAC uh, valuations. There was a recent study by, um, uh, by faculty from Stanford Law School and NYU Law School that showed that um, a, a high percentage of, of SPACs fall um, you know, below $10 uh, after the transaction. Um, you know, and I already addressed that I think that that's because you know, some of the companies going public via SPAC arguably uh, went earlier than maybe was optimal. We already talked about the fact that the SEC has become uh, somewhat less supportive of SPACs than it was under the prior administration. Um, I'm seeing that it's harder to secure pipes. You can still get uh, pipes uh, for SPAC targets, um, but uh, the pipe investors have become a little bit more cautious. And, and in my view, it helps to have elements that make the public story better in terms of having a company that's already well known in terms of having a, a straightforward story rather than one that requires a lot of nuance or explanation. And, and also a company that may already be showing revenue traction and not someone with a, a good story and, and a hockey stick um, a set of uh, projections. But where I uh, wanna end uh, my slides is what does this mean for finance professionals? Because that, that's really a, a large number of the people in the audience today. As I mentioned, I think finance can be a gating item in whether a company is ready to go public faster. Um, but the fact that it's a gating item means that the growth in the number of public companies created by SPACs as a tool means there are more public company CFO roles and more job opportunities for the type for, for the average uh, FANG member. Um, so I think that's, th that's something to really pay attention to. Um, I also think that uh, there's more opportunity for board seats. Uh, there are more public companies. Um, I, you know, I found that um, I'm getting more inquiries about board seats myself uh, over the last year than I had gotten in the prior year. And, and I think that it's just because um, you know, there, there's, you know, the uh, people with finance skills are relatively more in demand to join the boards of the companies uh, planning to go public via SPAC and that have already gone public via SPAC. Uh, the, the SPAC boom has been a, a great uh, stimulus for accounting and audit firms. Uh, they're a bit overwhelmed um, to the point where um, we've talked to target companies and told them if they want to be considered to be a, a partner with our SPAC, they'll need audited financials. And some of them have come back and said the audit firms are saying they can't take any more business and they're referring them to, to regional firms uh, as opposed to the big four. Um, so uh, if, if you're an auditor, that, that may be good news for you. But if you want to get your financials audited, um, you, may, uh, you, you, you may have to lean on your uh, relationships uh, within the audit firms. We already discussed the fact that warrant accounting has created some administrative uncertainty and work uh, for SPACs. I agree with Robert that it's all navigable. Um, so it's not uh, necessarily going to stop SPACs, but I think that it is a little bit of a speed bump as hundreds of SPACs are, are scrambling to get their, um, their financial statements in order uh, and determine whether the warrants are, are equity or, or liability. Um, there is a little bit more litigation around disclosure. Um, uh, the, uh, SPACs need to be ever more conscientious about uh, how they disclose um, and what they disclose and when they disclose. Um, and uh, uh, sometimes you can do everything right and still face litigation, uh, but you can take steps to try to minimize uh, that risk. And it's really worth investing the, the time and the legal fees to do so. Um, and lastly, I would note that uh, DNO insurance uh, has become expensive. I think the view a year or two ago had been that, that because it's somewhat structurally simple, it shouldn't be that big a DNO issue because it's not technically an IPO. Uh, the public company is an empty shell with cash, so there's not a lot of uh, complication there. And then the actual transaction is a merger. It's not an IPO. Um, 
but given the litigation around disclosure, um, uh, DNO insurance has uh, really significantly increased in cost and, and decreased in the amount available, I think, just, just over the last uh, couple of quarters. Um, so th those are some of the things that I thought this audience might might appreciate about both the opportunities and the risks that SPACs create for um, longtime finance professionals like like many of us are. Um, let me let me pause there and, uh, and and turn it back to Mark to ensure a we can ask any more questions and b that, that we leave time for for Robert's uh, uh, remarks as well. Excellent, fantastic. Um, Eric, thank you, and I'm um, really, really enjoying this uh, this conversation, um, folks, and uh, and and the engagement from from the audience. It wouldn't be as interesting if the audience didn't engage, and all of our speakers really wanted that as well. So, if anyone um, has any questions specifically for Eric, feel free to unmute yourself. You know, show us your face if you're, you know. A Chine dude's in a t-shirt. I know I've got my tie on. Don't let that, um, you know, don't let that scare you or whatever. Like we're, we're all friends here. So um, so this question is from, from Jim. Thanks, thanks, Jim. Um, what is the magnitude of fees that a target incurs by going public via SPAC? It's a good question. And um, Eric, Eric, if you, yeah, go, thank you. I, I don't, uh, I don't, I think there are people on this call that are better uh, qualified to answer that than I am. Um, Adele Hogan, can you please, yeah. um, can you please unmute yourself? I, I've really, I've been trying to get you as one of my speakers for a while as well. So um, she's a, a FANG member and, um, but, you know, highly decorated uh, attorney and go ahead. I'll, I'll let you answer for yourself. So Mark, that means a lot coming from you. Thank you very much. But I'm always happy to help anybody in the FANG group, you know, free of charge to get, get you going in these areas. But basically every IPO has the fees listed. I mean, if I'm doing a three to $500 million SPAC, um, it's often, you know, kind of millions, like, like could be $8 million, but that comes from sort of seed investors, what we call founders. And then the people that set it up and are sort of the intellectual capital, they're not really putting in that kind of money at all. They're, they're putting in very little and uh, all of them are sharing that a 20% founders promote. Fantastic. Hi, hi this, sorry, this is Jim. I, I, the, fee, uh, the fees I'm referring to are the fees of the target company, not the, not the SPAC sponsor. So from a target's perspective, what does it cost to go public via this channel. So as a target, you're you're going to be the um, the SPAC is going to come after you, and, and they're going to go through a D SPAC procedure. And most of the fees are really on the on the acquirer because they have to go back into the SEC and get this approved through um, it's it's an S four, it's a technical thing, but it's a merger proxy basically. And so you would just be going through a normal diligence process. So you will have lawyers involved, but it's really just to do a sale of your company. You will be, the kinds of things you would negotiate are employment agreements, perhaps with your executives, um, some SEC advice, just because you don't want to get married. And, um, you know, looking at some of the merger papers, but it's much, much less than the acquirer, of course. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, hey, 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 Adele, so, sorry, just a follow-up question on that. So, you often hear about the 20% founders fee or what is that all about then? Isn't that effectively the fee that the, the organization is? Yeah, so if you're setting up a SPAC, what you wanna do is um, you guys, you know, you're, you may be um, called upon to be the executives or the CFO or, or is there's usually a scramble who's gonna serve in which capacity, which can often be a, you know, a call at midnight where you just decide. But then you get these key investors. And if you're short on money, um, often the big banks that do, or, or small banks that do these, this kind of work will help you get the last, you know, couple million you need to put together because there's certain investors that want to do this. And also investors call me, they probably call other people on this call looking for SPACs to invest in. So we often have a, a list of some people that might be interested as well. Excellent, perfect. And then any other questions or additions to that? 
And Jack, if you want to unmute yourself, um, Jack Bone, if you want to unmute yourself and ask your question, or I can I can MC for you. There's, okay. there's, a, there's a question about the audit. How much does the audit cost? Go ahead. And, and um, there, if you look at all that the documents, you'll see that the normal audit fee is for the SPAC to do the audit, which would include the thing that they're acquiring in the S4. So not in the IPO phase, because in the IPO phase, remember, you can't have any identified target. Otherwise, you have to put it in your S1 IPO. So you have to have like, so I've had banks sometimes tell their the SPAC people, they need 18 targets. You need to have a broad range so that we know that you're looking at a, a broad range and that we're not gonna have a tr trouble with the SEC. And if the, if the target is short on funds or cash, I mean, that's part of the reason you're doing a SPAC, negotiate to get the SPAC to pay some of your audit fees because it's gonna get wrapped up into their audit anyway. Don't feel like you have to bear all that if you're not able to. Adele Hogan, dropping the gems, thank you. Thanks. Um, Mark, I had a question and um, uh, Eric um, mentioned the, the auditor backlog, like a, a lot of the, the SPACs um, uh, have, including the one that I'm about to go work for, have, have uh, smaller firms like Markham um, as their auditors and they, they are completely backed up. Um, but what can be done about that? I mean, could, can you switch auditors? I mean, because I know when I worked in the big four, five or six, as it was when I started, you, you know, you, you didn't change auditors if you were a listed company. But um, what what can be done now if you're if you're really struggling, if your audit firm is really struggling to get through what you know what shouldn't be a, a, a hard uh, you know quarterly or, or annual uh, review process? Uh, I, I don't think there's a stigma associated with switching auditors right now because, because you know, in the past, the stigma was, well, if you switched auditors, maybe it's because they, they were trying to hold your feet to the fire for something that you wanted to do that maybe you shouldn't have been doing. Um, but now I think everybody it's understands that, it's, that the auditors are, are so busy that, that you can have reasons for switching that have nothing to do with your level of financial conservatism or aggressiveness. I'll just say that a different spec, so I'm, I'm part of this Archimedes spec, but a different spec that the same spec sponsors have um, had a target where their own auditors said, we're too busy to, to, to produce these audited financials for you, but but we're going to refer you to this smaller firm that, that will do it. And so their own long-term auditor was sending them elsewhere uh, so that they could remain in, in the hunt uh, to, you know, to, to be a SPAC. So I'm curious what other people have found, but it, it seems to me that the stigma is, is not there as much now in, in this environment. The other thing I would say is um, there are a lot of advisors out there that are actually quite useful because they can help put together the financials. So you're, you're taking up less of the accountant's time because time is money. Markham, I think, is the number one in the SPAC area. Also, you want to work with experienced um, lawyers or whatever because they can help do a lot of this too. And of course, a lot of SPACs got sidelined because of the way um, certain warrants were treated as as uh, equity and they should have been treated as debt. So that there's like hundreds of SPACs that had to then um, are late in their filings as they get all this re-audited. So there's, there is a huge backlog. So anything you can do to make yourself appealing to the auditors and low maintenance and like you know what you're doing, even if it's your professionals that are helping you will help you get through this process. Yeah, I, I think the other, the other important point that Eric raised earlier on was about is the finance function ready for being a public organization, right? Uh, there is a one-time process to get you ready for the, the merger with the SPAC, but then there's an ongoing requirement. And I think that is equal, equally important that you have the right caliber of people uh, in, in your respective teams to be able to execute on, on a regular basis. And that includes you know, investor relations and the like as well, right? Yeah, I, I feel strongly about that. I mean, uh, the other members of my SPAC like to talk to the CEO and I, I tell the CEO to go away and I sit down with the CFO and, and, and say, you know, you really want to be a public reporting entity in six months, you know, and, 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 and I, and in many cases, I identify that, that for a company to move forward, um, 
you know, using the spec, they may need to bring in a more experienced uh, CFO than, than whoever they have at that moment. That's why you guys are so valuable because you could step in and help. Excellent, uh, fantastic. And then I guess we could take one more question um, or comment. We had a comment from A. Coughlin. Hopefully I said that correctly. Uh, the challenge for audit firms is relatively small fee for a super fast turnaround time, potential reputational risk due to complex warrant accounting issues. Also, staff may not have the skill set. Don't know what. I don't know if you want to expound on that for us, um, Mr. or Mrs. Coughlin. I'm not sure if that's a lady or a gentleman. Yeah, I work at um, BKD, and um, we've Great. been approached to do a lot of these deals. Um, and I think the, the concentration of these SPAC deals is uh, three or four firms that are doing 95% of them. So it, it's kind of stepping outside the comfort zone, except for an existing client or private equity relationship. Um, it, it's um, debated among the partners, how deep do we wanna dive into that pool? Excellent, fantastic, superb. Um, I think I, I got your message the other day. I wanted to, you had a report on SPACs, is that correct? That's correct. Superb, yeah. Do you mind kindly sharing it in the chat uh, for our for our audience members so that, um, you know, I want to make sure that they get as much information on this for, you know, because some of us are not experts like yourself and some of the other uh, individuals like Adele and obviously our panelists. So, um, we will we will not be concluding at uh, four thirty. If uh, for those that want to stay on, we're going to have to do further Q and A. Um, we're going to have Robert uh, come on now, and um, just letting you know, others that want to leave, please go ahead. If folks want to, you know, it's five o'clock somewhere. If you want to go ahead and get your five o'clock beverage, and you know, kind of continue the conversation. You know, this is what we're here for. For others that have other things to do, um, kindly feel free to to leave. And um, Bob, I, t I told you this would happen, so um, <laughs> I said it would happen. He was kind of I was like, no, it's not gonna be enough time. Okay, so this is great. So uh, Robert Fuchs, managing partner, Tree Street Advisors. Robert actually is also a Feng member, and he reached out to me once he saw um, the talk, and so. Uh, I am always interested in hearing from members regarding uh, 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 topics and also speakers. So like I said, Adele, I have reached out to you a couple of times, but you know, Adele is a, is a superstar. So I'm, I'm kind of waiting for her to, you know, get back to me so we can have her on there. But not to take away from Robert, managing partner of Tree Street Advisors, an advisory firm focused on helping institutional investors and others navigate the SPAC marketplace. He advises several institutional institutions formally and informally on SPAC related matters. Mr. Fuchs is a sub-advisor to a large multi-strategy hedge fund on a dedicated SPAC fund. Robert is an investment professional who's been working in the investment banking capital market space for over 25 years. During that time, Robert has intimately been involved in $1.7 billion worth of SPAC issuances. Mr. Fuchs, thank you. Whenever you're um, ready, if you have uh, a few slides for us, please go ahead and share them or I can go into your Q&A for you. How's that? It's wonderful, thank you. Excellent, thank you very much. Mark, Chenadu, Joyce, Eric, um, this has been uh, fantastic. Um, there is nothing like being introduced as the last panelist <laughs> and being told to get off and get their drinks. Um, so I hope that I have something to add, but this has been, Mark, this has been awesome. It's been a, a really, really great panel. Um, you know, Mark gave you some of my background. Let me just reiterate some of it, but, um, you know, I think that it's relevant to the conversation. I'm an investment professional, over 25 years of uh, experience in asset management, investment banking, and capital markets. I started Tree Street in 2020, uh, focus on SPAC related advisory. I'm currently an advisor and partner to S3 Global, large multi global multi strategy hedge fund. 
um, and we are investing selectively in, uh, in, in SPACs. Um, and then aside from that, I'm advising US and other international entities, mostly in Europe, on various SPAC opportunities. Um, previously, and I think what makes me you know, somewhat unique, I was involved from the banking, excuse me, from the banking side in about a billion seven of SPAC issuances from 2004 to 2008. Um, that was when, for those people that are familiar with the SPAC market, that was when it actually took four years, not a week, uh, to raise a billion seven. Um, we were involved, and I should also give a shout out to Matt and his firm Mintz, because Ken Koch was our uh, lead attorney on, I think, almost everything that we did. So, you know, big fans of, of Mintz Levin. Um, we were involved with Navius Maritime, which was the first SPAC ever to raise over $100 million, which is quite hard to believe these days. Um, they were the first SPAC to list on the New York Stock Exchange, first SPAC to reach a billion dollars in uh, market value. And uh, they are uh, still an entity that exists and trades with, uh, I believe it's well over a billion dollars in market cap. Um, Energy 21, which was an oil and gas focused SPAC, we raised $300 million on the AIM market in London, eventually transferring their um, uh, ticker to the US. Um, they were uh, oil and gas company, wound up hitting some bumps eventually in the oil and gas space, but really were a well-established kind of public entity. Uh, they wound up going bankrupt, but that was well years after they had actually done this back. Um, and then finally, and this is just, these are just some examples, but I think they're different, uh, Globe Metals, which was uh, North America's largest producer of silicone. Uh, they ultimately merged with Grupo Ferro Atlantica, and uh, I believe they had about a, a $3.2 billion total enterprise value at the merger. Um, as well, prior to that time, I helped lead investing efforts in over 500 million investments in private equity and venture capital funds. And out of advisor associates, we invested in firms like Bain Capital, Apollo, Summit Ventures, Bain Ventures, TCV, um, which I think has a lot of relevance to kind of what's happening in the SPAC market today. As you see, um, groups like this, particularly over the last six to 12 months, have started entering uh, the SPAC market um, and raising capital. And I think it's becoming kind of a, another leg to the, to the private equity stool. Um, I started my career in corporate finance at uh, Drexel Burnham. So I don't know if that dates me, um, but I know that the Feng skews a little older. So hopefully everyone uh, remembers Drexel. And I have an MBA in finance uh, from Columbia Business School. The next slide, you know, I put together really, you know, it, Obviously, it just sounds like everyone here, and I think Eric acknowledged this, is pretty familiar with the SPAC structure. I, I, I am amazed at how often I talk to people and they think, you know, they want to merge in, uh, you know, an early stage venture company into a SPAC. Um, but, you know, I think it's a very straightforward product. Uh, I like to call it, you know, it's, it's, a public single use private equity fund for all intents and purposes. Um, I think everyone, you know, is kind of familiar with this stuff and I'm happy to talk or share any of this um, on the side. Going to the next slide, and I think this again is something that has been covered, but maybe not specifically, um, you know, as for, and for, for people that are thinking about issuing a SPAC or uh, are involved in teams that are issuing SPACs, uh, you know, what I've seen is the characteristics of successful SPAC issuers, um, track record of value creation. Obviously, if it's been done in a public company, that's all the better. An investor following, um, clearly an M&A track record, a deal execution capabilities, um, infrastructure in place to find and execute a high quality transaction. Uh, proprietary to the extent possible, deal sourcing network and access to executives board, um, partnership with a deal platform, either you're part of a deal platform like a private equity firm or venture capital firm, um, prior to SPAC experience. Uh, I, you know, I said something the other day that I, I believe I heard from someone else. I think that we're, we're long gone 
it doesn't always appear to be this way, but we're long gone from the days of SPACs that were really two guys and a, uh, and a laptop. And I think that that is um, certainly what differentiates this market, but I think that it's also, you know, the danger for those people who think this is gonna be easy and, you know, I'm gonna raise a boatload of money and, you know, take in deals from investment banks. It is, that will not be a fun experience for you. Um, you know, again, this is kind of stuff that we've talked about, but the ideal targets for SPAC acquisitions, public market ready. I know Eric, you know, talked about this and I don't think you can talk about it enough because if your finance function is not in place, if you're not ready to be a public company, if you're not uh, organized, you're, this isn't, it's not gonna be a good process. Um, you want to have a solid management team that has the potential to be supplemented, whether it's replacing a CFO, whether it's adding board members, whether it's adding, you know, key, key team people, particularly investor relations, things like that. Um, you know, the third point here, benefit from access to the SPAC sponsor team. Obviously, you know, everyone is going to be different, but to the extent that you're merging with a team that the sponsor of the SPAC can actually add value. It's not always the case and it's not always needed or necessary, but to the extent that you want to lean on someone and that becomes part of your thought process as far as, um, you know, who you're going to team up with, as far as a sponsor is concerned, you may want to find somebody who can be helpful, whether it's people who know Wall Street, whether it's people who are strategic, whether it's people who can be helpful from board level, et cetera. Um, you know, the fourth point, which we haven't really talked about a lot, but I think that part of the benefit of, of using the SPAC as a merger vehicle is the ability to give extended investor education prior to listing. And what does that mean? It, you know, it's about really talking, sitting, you know, this isn't an IPO roadshow that goes on for a week and people throw in their orders based on a 45 minute meeting. But here you have an opportunity to to really sit down with investors, explain to them what you're doing, and go through a business plan, projections, get through diligence. And I think, again, to Eric's point before, which I think was very good, is if people don't like the story, you're probably not going to go ahead with the deal. Um, but I think it really gives you the chance to meet with institutional investors and others that have the ability to really um, get to know the company and do the diligence. Um, flexibility and consideration, have a desire to maintain upside. What that really means is, you know, are you going to roll all of your equity? Are, you know, a portion of your investors going to roll all of their equity? Are you looking, you know, to raise primary capital? Are you really looking to um, exit, uh, use this as an exit vehicle? You know, I think those are all things that you need to think about. Um, and I don't think that a SPAC is a great exit vehicle, uh, maybe for a small portion of your shares, either near term or midterm, but it, it's probably not the way to go if you're really looking to exit. Um, you know, again, these are things that we may have gone through, but, and this is something I, I think I stole from JP Morgan, but you know, really there are three key constituents here, the SPAC sponsor, the SPAC IPO buyer, the public investor. Um, and then, you know, the benefits, the seller, the, the actual seller to the SPAC. And I think each of them have to have different considerations um, going into this. Um, you know, we are primarily a public equity um, buyer of SPAC shares and IPOs in, in the secondary market. So we've got, you know, kind of a strategy that we look at that's mostly related around arbitrage and being selective about, you know, who we're investing with. Other people are much more arbitrary. People have different, you know, ways of looking at this. I'm happy to, uh, instead of going through this, I'm happy to kind of share this with uh, whoever wants. And the last slide, you know, I think is important. And Chenandu, I think you, you hit some of this, but this was a recent uh, piece that was uh, in the New York Times deal book um, and sent out in their newsletter where Stephen Davidoff Solomon, who's called the deal professor, um, wrote an 
short, an article, which I think you can get, which again, I can share with you, but I think is behind the Times paywall, is called in defense of SPACs. And I think it's an important thing. There are a couple of points that I think he made here that I think were important that, you know, there, there's been a lot of negative perception of SPACs. Some of, some of that is deserved, some of it's not. But, you know, I think that there are a number of things that people, you know, continuously forget about um, sort of the, uh, the public equity market. Um, number one, you know, and this is something that's been chased forever, but all of a sudden innovative smaller companies now have a way of accessing the public markets. And that's something that has been something that uh, the SEC in Washington has wanted to see for a long time. Um, for those of us who remember the 1990s, you were dealing with you know, very well-established boutique investment banks that took technology companies, life science companies, public groups like Alex Brown, Hamilton Quist, Robertson Stevens, Montgomery. They were, they were underwriting 130 IPOs a year. And you know, without a doubt, they brought public some very, very large companies today. I'm sure they also took public companies who are no longer in existence. Um, you know, I think the third point is also interesting. We're all sitting here talking about, you know, should these companies be public? Should they not be public? But, you know, a year ago, people, or two years ago, all that people were talking about was how the venture guys were keeping the companies private too long and they weren't taking companies public. So you sort of can't have it both ways. You either are willing to establish public companies or you want to keep them private. I think here, you know, we're really talking about, you um, the ability for investors in the public equity markets to um, access many of these companies. Um, and again, I, I think that comes with um, the fourth point here, which is SPACs are bringing riskier, you know, it's, it's some, I'm not gonna say all, but SPACs are bringing riskier companies to market and stock market 101 suggests that with more risk come more rewards and more failures. So, um, you know, I don't mean to overplay any of this stuff, but I think that, you know, for all of the negativity that goes on in the SPAC market, I think that there is, you know, certainly, you know, some very good um, backup to say that it, it's providing a tremendous, tremendous service, both to the private and to the public equity markets. And that's it, Mark, you can take it back. Excellent, thank you. Um, uh, Robert, and we've got a couple more questions um, that you know we can we can ask to 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 Robert. And I, I shared all the uh, speakers' information in the chat, so please do reach out to them. Um, this is the thing, Financial Executives Networking Group. So <laughs> it's kind of in the title, so please don't be shy. Um, so fantastic. Um, so, and all three of you would like you to chime in and perhaps Adele as well. And um, Ms. Coughlin, I know you're here from BKD. What do you think about of the SPAC boom's effect on the technology uh, M&A marketplace? Just quickly as, as a lawyer, I, I am so happy about this, this vibrancy in the capital markets. I'm like, I, I agree with all the other speakers like Robert and Eric. And, and Mark, this is fabulous because there are opportunities for people to invest in almost like a private equity type um, structure. So it's very exciting. And, and there'll be hits and misses and that's just kind of, yeah. do you want to have the opportunities out there where people can get in on some of these deals? Um, my view is similar to Adele's and what Robert brought up is that um, it is returning to the time where people can participate in the the risk that is normally kind of positioned for pension funds and billionaires investors it's gotten it the risk appetite has skewed way too much towards um, the you know too 
away from the mom and pop investor, not allowing for everyone to participate. When I, so I'm glad that that is the effect on the private market or the effect on technology and M&A, um, I think will probably be more answered, it will be better answered by some of the financial professionals here who are surveying the market and seeing whether um, and have seen whether the potential targets are willing to talk or are they looking for higher bids. But from what I'm seeing uh, from uh, private market portfolios um, and other managers like myself, it hasn't affected our valuations at the at the deal level, but it has expected our expectations in once we've invested in the later stages, like what we expect our founders to go and get in the follow on rounds is far higher than what we would have before. So I think in that way, we're encouraging uh, the bid up uh, for SPACs to take advantage of it, just like we would encourage um, our uh, founders to take advantage of the IPO window. We're telling them to take advantage of the, uh, uh, the public merger window as well. We're not sure it's gonna last forever, so it's just to take advantage of it now. Nice. And um, I believe we have uh, an attendee from, from SPAC Insider and, and they have, uh, you know, not to promote them or anything, but they do have a great uh, website. Sometimes, you know, it can be hard to find useful, uh, accurate information. So if you don't mind uh, uh, chiming in, I would, I would love to hear your, your uh, insights from um, SPAC Insider. Uh, yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, apologies, everybody. I, I wasn't totally prepared. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, forgive me, because right now it's actually um, SEC filing time for the US. So I'm sort of participating in this and also watching SEC filing. So um, forgive me, Mark, but can you sort of refresh me on the question? No worries. Uh, we were talking about the um, SPAC boom effects on the technology M&A marketplace. Uh, well, yeah, so, so it, it's sort of difficult right now for a lot of SPACs, um, particularly because of um, the de-SPAC market, right? Like we, I know a few of you have sort of touched on SPAC, uh, the pipe market, um, but right now, um, as many of you or many of you may not know, SPACs can be highly, highly cyclical. Um, we are definitely in a down market right now. Um, and because of that, you'll see a lot of SPACs currently trading at or near uh, cash and trust value um, ahead of the SPAC vote. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that they are going to do poorly post vote. It um, unfortunately means right now it's, it's become quite complicated in the sense that if you look at the um, let's call it the last 20 shareholder votes. Um, and let's forget for a minute, just technology SPACs, but let's say all SPACs. Uh, generally, if they've traded at or close to cash and trust value, they have traded up post transaction, which is definitely, definitely different than in the past. Usually you've generally seen SPACs trade down a little bit post vote. Um, and the thinking is that, uh, institutional money long only right the the natural holder of these deals post vote is waiting um which they haven't in the past right like if if they've wanted to participate in the SPAC um or the company post vote they would have bought ahead of it which created demand which pushed the share price up ahead of cash and trust value um ahead of the vote and we haven't seen that we've seen them um sort of stepping out and waiting uh, they don't want the risk. They're buying post vote, um, and that's what we're seeing. Just one other thing we're seeing is um, companies that are. Um, we, we do a lot at our firm on um, what we call uplifts, where we're taking companies that are sort of at the bottom of the chain and bringing them up back up by recapitalizing them or doing a merger. So though that can often be a cheaper way to get your merger done or sell to a target than doing a SPAC where there's an initial dilution. So we're seeing an incredible amount of M&A activity in that space as well, but it's partly related to this. 
Excellent. Uh, fantastic. Uh, Robert, did you want to uh, chime in perhaps? Yeah, no, look, I, I think that overall, I think that it's only a positive, um, you know, for the technology MA marketplace. There's another player at the table for companies to explore alternatives with, and it may be, you know, that this is the right mechanism for any individual company to go public. Um, and it may be a mechanism for, for them to accelerate whatever it is that they're doing. You know, on the other hand, I think that if people see this as a shortcut to getting public and untold amounts of equity capital that it can unlock, not so sure it's a good idea. Um, I think you really need to go in with your eyes wide open and you need to, you know, have good people around you that can kind of help you, you know, sort of manage your own expectations. And then the other thing that I would just mention that I think people don't think about is that the, the more public companies that are out there and the more public currency that's out there, the more opportunity there is for um, M&A, you know, from the private market to the public market where companies are now going to be able to use stock and potentially cash to buy some, some of Chengdu's, um, you know, venture companies, earlier stage companies. So I think that there is a virtuous circle where the more public companies there are, the more opportunity there is for um, you know, technology companies to, uh, to merge or to find kind of the right partner in the M&A marketplace. Excellent. And so what do you think the future holds? I mean, you may have touched on it, uh, for SPAC issuances and mergers and how will that affect the technology, technology M&A, Robert? No, so look, I, I think that for the companies that are going public too early, um, you know, I think that it's going to be a very challenging time and that there's going to be a big wake up call to realizing what it is to run a public company and be in the public uh, eye, as I think uh, some people have seen more recently, um, you know, who, who had to resign from their positions uh, running, uh, running public SPACs, um, you know, so I think that that's, you know, potentially, you know, a big negative here and people really, and I think Eric, you know, said this and I said it, at the end of the day, you really have to be ready to go public and be ready, you know, for everything that being a public company um, means. Um, so so I, I, have a, I have a question um, that is, um, kind of focused on post acquisition or during the acquisition, how are acquirers sort of putting golden handcuffs on these founders such that they don't sell down their position or um, are you putting some money on the table so that they can feel comfortable to go at it for the long haul or what's, what's happening to really de-risk you know, the founders and the key people involved in these transactions? Great question, Chine. Do Adele, do you want to chime in for us? Yes, a lot of times these people have employment agreements and more important lockups where they are not allowed to sell for a period of time because you want them to stay focused on the business. You might give them some liquidity or something, but you really want people to invest and stay focused. Wonderful. <laughs> Any, any other folks? Oh, great. I was going to ask you to. Thank you very much, Back Insider. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I kind of wanted to chime in on this. Um, so lockups have been something that has been a particular focus for um, not just the investing community, but uh, obviously, uh, particularly in the media as well. Um, you have seen recently a lot of deals come out with, uh, like, for instance, let's just take Altimeter, right? They bought the, or they're not, well, they're attempting to buy uh, the company called Grab, right? Which has a 35 billion uh, enterprise value, huge company. Um, they came out and they said they were going to subject themselves to a three-year lockup for their founders promote um, with no outs. Uh, you usually see with most founders promotes, some ability to take some off the table based on a price hurdle of like 1250 usually, or sometimes even higher. Um, but they came out and they said, you know what? No, we're, we're, 
we, we have uh, projected out um, valuation based on multiples on 2025 or 2024 or 2026, and we're going to subject ourselves to a three-year lockup regardless just to align ourselves with the investing public. Um, and that was received pretty positively. Um, you've also seen a lot of uh, SPACs come out um, at IPO, not necessarily even at combination that have uh, introduced different lockup strategies. Um, you've seen uh, different specs, like for instance, uh, Ribbit Leap, uh, which has a leap structure, which has class L shares, which they don't get to promote until the share trades at 20, 30, 40, and $50, right? So, um, or you have executive networking, uh, network partnering, um, Parifos, which is the Evercore structure. Um, there has been a lot of in innovation this year regarding the promote structure. Um, trying to align companies and investors and the promote. Um, and I personally think that will be the um, the momentum going forward. You know, I, I think that investors want that. I think the SEC wants that. I think companies want that. Um, I'm hopeful that we will see that going forward. Um, but to date, um, there are just a lot of SPACs out there trying to go public. And for right now, the majority of them don't have that sort of alignment. Thank you very much, Robert. I, Mark, I will echo Christy's words. And I think that from an investor's perspective, um, you know, seeing groups that are willing to lock up their shares for multi, you know, multiple years uh, or have very significant hurdles um, is a big positive and I think is going to be the way that people can differentiate themselves as far as the uh, sponsor economics are concerned. Um, and, I, and I think that that is going to be, as we move forward, that's going to separate the wheat from the chaff, is people who are willing to eat their own cooking and, and be able to you know, stick with a company and not find out that six months after they uh, merged that they're dumping all their shares in the stock, you know, falls off a cliff. Fantastic. That's great. Excellent. And uh, Christy, if you could just briefly, you know, um, I know you said you uh, w w felt like you're being intrusive, but this is about sharing knowledge and information. Um, just briefly tell us a, just a little bit about your background and, and SPAC Insider. I, I found, you know, whilst I was doing some research for this event, I found your website and it's, again, I think it's it's a great resource. Uh, yeah, so, uh, sorry everybody. I, I was invited to this a little bit late. I, I joined a little bit late, so um, uh, I'm not gonna go on video because I'm literally in uh, not professional clothes. <laughs> 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 um, but yeah, so I, I generally, we, the company I run, um, there's uh, eight of us at this point. Um, we basically cover all data and analysis covering the SPAC asset class, uh, provide analysis on the space as well. Uh, uh, yeah, you can find us at SPACinsider.com. Uh, I hope that's helpful. No, that's that's great. And and, and again, um, this is for you know sharing information and, and us all adding value uh, to each other, the speakers um, and, and also, uh, the audience. And um, we've run over uh, about 15 minutes or so. So uh, what I'm going to do is uh, close the meeting. Um, I think we will have a, a part two to this conversation. I think there's a, a lot of information that, you know, people are seeking, probably have a couple of accountants on the panel. Uh, I think I'm going to invite Adele and, and Christy as well. Um, and and um, we're all going to, you know, learn from one another and, and become uh, better, better professionals um, as a result of it. And so once again, my name is uh, Mark Erebogbo. I am a chairman of the Capital Markets Special Interest Group with the FANG Financial Executives Networking Group. If you're not a member of the FANG, um, please, you know, either reach out to me or go on the website. It's a, it's a great organization. It feels like uh, 
you know, it feels like the mafia almost, it's a family, so to speak. Um, and um, it, it's, it's a very warm organization. I've been involved in uh, various different professional associations. And the thing is a very warm organization. Like I said, Robert reached out to me and he's like, hey, Mark, you know, I'd love to share once he saw Chino do's talk. I called Eric as a member and again, same kind of thing. So um, if you're not actively using the FANG, um, you know, uh, membership, you're, you're, you're missing out on a great resource. Um, so, you know, go into the database, you know, look, look folks up and, uh, and go out and, you know, do what it says on the tin, right? Financial Executives Networking Group. So, um, superb. So thank you uh, once again, everyone. Uh, really appreciate you joining and, and then staying on with us a little bit off the time. I told you, Bob, this would happen. So um, people people want to hear, people do want to hear this. And once, you know, time, time flies when you're having fun, I definitely had fun. So Robert Fuchs, thank you very much. Eric Ball, thank you very much. Chine Du Inekwe, thank you very much. Adele, uh, thank you for chiming in as well. Christy, thank you for chiming in. Folks, uh, you know, please do make sure you 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 reach out and network. I do, I do go to a lot of these things and it's surprising how, you know, little people connect. And so I definitely wanna uh, make an emphasis to make sure that everyone does reach out and connect with one another and we'll all be better for it. So thank you.